Hello, welcome to the Diploma in Functional Performance and Diploma in Functional Therapy uh, talk on why we do the things we do, why we pick our functional principles and our faster principles towards training and then carrying on to look at bone motion. This course is relevant whether you're doing the Diploma in Functional Performance or the Diploma in Functional Therapy. Uh, my name's John Hardy. I wrote the course, um, but I was influenced by many people. So everything you get to hear in this is a reflection of the years that I've spent speaking to people and meeting people and hanging around with, with people who know a lot. It's important to know that whenever you meet an innovator, you're really just meeting someone who's good at hiding their sources. I'm not particularly an innovator. I've just taken things that I've learned and constructed them in a way that can help you to develop your own thought process. And this is just continuing that train of thought. This is the introductory mod module for functional performance, but this might appear a bit later on on functional therapy. And the reason for that is in functional performance, we're looking to find a movement challenge within the body um, and we're looking within a body that moves really well which means it's difficult to find because the person you're working with is athletic and good at covering mistakes whereas in the diploma in functional therapy we have something diagnosed that we can work on and so that means our viewpoint of the movement is going to be pretty um, predictable. If you've torn a muscle in an area, that'll give you a predictable way of compensating and it's quite hard to hide. The important thing here is for the therapist, as the client gets better, they will get better at hiding things. For the um, performance trainer, your client will already hide things. For both trainers, you need to have an ability to observe motion because that'll help you later then develop skills to make predictable movements happen. So we start off with faster principles. Um, and our faster principles are built up um, from years of working with people, reading science, hanging around with good academics, hanging around with good technicians, and piecing together a system that works for us. And in no way are we saying this is the final version. We're just saying this is where we are in our learning. And we want to shortcut you to this point so that you can then go away and grow and grab the baton. And so the first thing that we think is that the majority of muscle contractions in the body are subconscious when you're performing any movement. And so you may have an initial conscious movement um, which is uh, often described as a driver, um, a term that, that Gary Gray made very popular, where you have a motivation to move and then you, you physically prepare for that and something in your body moves. And from that one thing that moves, the rest of the body starts to react. And so most training that we've come across focuses on the want to move but doesn't focus on the how your body reacts. And I think this is something that lets us down when we get to the final component of building an exercise. The best way to get training transfer is to get as close to the movements that need to be improved as possible, which is kind of a, a long way of saying, if you wanna run, make sure your training looks like running. Um, this, is, this could be literal. So you could see someone in a split squat with sp split arms trying to trying to mimic a run with dumbbells or, or it might be a little more clever where you might see someone stretching a hip on a bench but they position the hip in a, in a position that replicates the forces going through the body um, and they've rotated the spine to replicate the spine position when the hips are in the position that that's needed to improve range in running and by that I just mean it's not as simple as saying here's running all your training should be running 
but weighted or without shoes and with shoes it's a, it can be a little a little more clever you could say i want to do a bench press for running and that could determine using one arm to press the the dumbbell having one leg off of the bench one leg on the bench and although it's not perfect it's not ideal for running it might resemble running enough that you can use it and your client might just like doing bench press and that might be as good a reason as any to sort of take that middle ground to design a movement that's close to the client's goal you require the ability to sequence a motion and this is this is the thing that I learned really early on um, my background is sports coaching that was my first degree and that made me look at people move and work out how to get them to move better and it was less about how much weight you can move or how fast you moved and it was more about the technique of striking or receiving or the ability to get your body to move somewhere in response to a play happening um, the important thing there is to know sequences if you go and take a golf lesson then you'll know that the golf coach is phenomenal at sequencing and that's sort of an internal thing that's a you should move your arms that should move your hips that should that should have a reaction in your foot then your hips should move out first then your arms should follow it's something that a coach will have ingrained in them whether they have the answers to improve it might might lie on the problem with the client and it might be simply skill and it might be something that's structural the important thing is from a training perspective that it, if you know the sequence to a motion of bone by bone joint by joint and muscle by muscle then you can start to replicate your exercises closely to the movement that you want the client to be good at sequencing motion needs a grasp of how to describe bones joints and muscles in movement so this is where I need to put my hands up and just tell you my anatomy was terrible. I scraped through my degree, I scraped through my master's degree, I scraped through every course requiring anatomy and I learned anatomy just before teaching it when I was a tutor on level two and level three UK personal training courses. And the main reason for this was that anatomy wasn't important anatomy was just a chunk of the course you learnt before you got to the good stuff of training people however since working in this way I've started to understand that anatomy and the description of anatomy is vital for personal understanding and then communicating to other people as you get through this course or as you'll have already seen depending when you're listening to this lecture you'll know that sometimes we change terminology in order to help us describe what's going on in a way that you can make more visual and perhaps this doesn't stand up to traditional anatomy and physiology terminology but it's something once you grasp you can easily substitute words into uh, one of the biggest problems I found is that a lot of terms jump from from one place to another and mean something completely different um, and a good example is that a, a lateral flexion in the spine involves one side of the body um, squeezing or contracting the other side lengthening but a, a, a lateral flexion of a bone in the spine is is describing the tilt of the bone and nothing squeezing or lengthening the bones just turning in space in the frontal plane and so we've changed a few things to try and make this this easier and part of that's what we're going to go through later on in this lecture is to just look at bone movement and see if we can describe it simply when we look at how the body reacts to movement um, we start with bones so we believe that bones move subconsciously because of gravity ground reaction or momentum or a combination of all three perhaps initially you can move a bone consciously perhaps within a skill you can consciously prevent or increase the movement of a bone 
but on on large you're looking at bones moving as a reaction uh, to the body moving and so we look at these subconscious movements and we say because of the way we chose to get from one place to another there will be forces acting on the body that are gravity ground reaction and momentum and these coming together will give you some predictable motions from one bone to the other and that will give you an order to start looking at how the body moves. The shape of the joint and how the bones sit on top of each other will help you determine these movements and will help with making things predictable. If you know something tilts that causes something else to rotate then you know if you see the rotation you should see the tilt. If you see the tilt you should see the rotation. And this, this helps us when we're predicting motion and starts to bring down the possibilities of what are happening down into a sort of a, a, a smaller, um, more focused place. And so your job becomes easier when describing these motions. Bones translate. So they, they move from one place to another regardless of the rotation around their own pivot point. And there's, there's three different sort of ways of describing this to, to describe what the bone's doing. So essentially we'll say the bone a bone can move from one place to another um, and and when it arrives there they'll it'll have taken components of three different forces or, or three different directions to get there. So it, a bone is either traveling forward or back, up or down, left or right. And most likely it's, it's traveling with all components of these and regardless of how it's spinning up upon its own axis, um, it'll arrive from one place to another. And you need to be able to describe this. This will specifically help when we get to points where we want to go hands-on or we want to drive a motion with a dumbbell or a band or a piece of suspension kit, perhaps. The bones rotate around their own pivot point in three different ways, regardless of where the bones are moving from and to which is kind of true and kind of wrong that where the bone moves from and to can affect how the bone spins and how the bone spins can affect where the bone moves to and from but they aren't necessarily related and so you could have a bone traveling forwards but it could be rotating anteriorly you could have a bone traveling backwards and it could be rotating anteriorly as well and so you need to be able to describe the spin of the bone around its own axis. Now both the spin of the bone and the translation are difficult to kind of picture um, without seeing some, some sort of examples. So let, let me show you some of those now. So we'll start with translation. So in this diagram we've got the start point of our skeleton and um, in the next diagram if you watch where the um, shin moved, where the tibia moved, it moved forward. So I, I can play that again for you. So it starts, it starts under the pelvis and then it ended up moving forward. The pelvis didn't go anywhere in space, so it definitely moved from A to B, which is sort of from, from, back, from back here to forward to there. So in the, in the next translation, we're looking at backwards, which is the opposite. So obviously we have our skeleton here hands in the air and then our skeleton reaches back and um, let's take the hands for instance they travel back but you could take um, the humerus or you could take the, the skull um, out of interest if you were looking at the pelvis you'll notice the pelvis move forward so if we come down to, to moving right if you look at the right humerus that moves right away from the body um, if you look at the right humerus now moving left, it moves left towards the body. And if you look at this this guy now, this is quite a cool jump. Starts in the squat position and then everything moves up. And if we want to look at down, it starts in the air and then lands on the floor and everything moves down. And so those are the movements you need to be able to describe, especially later when we introduce the HMAC form which is our form to describe motion and try and get you to to initially consciously think of sequencing so eventually 
you can subconsciously just know movement. Here's a little film of it all, all cracking off. So if we watch here, look, we have forward happening. Um, and so you can see how pretty much everything in that uh, right leg is going forwards. So here you'll see both arms and, and the spine going backwards. And like I say, as that happens, you'll also see the pelvis and the um, femur go forward. You see the, the right humerus here travel right. And there we, we didn't put any reaction. Right up towards the end, you'll see that the um, radial ulna went right then left. And here you'll see from this point, the radial ulna and the humerus will be traveling left. In this little clip, you see this lift and the whole body's traveling up. That's quite a cool jump. He'd be good in the air at football. And then we see the landing. And so Danny returns. And just see that bend the knee and everything comes through. I'm not saying that's a good landing technique, but definitely it showed that everything moved down. So once we've looked at how bones translate we need to look at how bones move um, around their own axis so you will see in this diagram we're looking at the right femur and what we want to see is the right femur moving anteriorly now a good way of doing this is to to imagine your head as being the bone we're trying to describe so in in this part if your head was right at the top of the bone near the pelvis and your chin was right at the bottom of the bone near the knee then as we move on to, to show the movement of anterior you'll notice that your forehead should stay where it is and your chin should tuck backwards and that's what we call an anterior rotation on the next the next slide we're going to show you um, a posterior rotation so again your head's at the top of the thigh your chin's at the bottom of the thigh and what you're going to do here is you're going to send your chin forward and your forehead back. Um, and I hope you're all doing this. I, I can't see through this screen, but uh, potentially we could send people around to have a look. So let's have a look at um, tilting. So th this would be called laterally flexing in um, some text. But we want to stay with tilting because we want to make it more um, realistic. To, to how people talk we want to make it about how you're going to describe the motion so here we're looking at, at this right humerus so your forehead's going to be at the top of the humerus uh, your chin's going to be at the bottom near the elbow and um, what we're going to do is we're going to left tilt this bone so you need to make sure that your chin starts traveling uh, right and up and your your forehead starts traveling left and down and so that will give you the left tilt. Here we go, go for a right tilt. And so this time you want to start with your head left tilted. So you want to start with your forehead. Um, so let's put your left ear down to your shoulder. Because um, your forehead's the shoulder on the right side here. And put your chin, just keep your chin where it is. And your chin's really rep representing the elbow. And then as we move from that position down, then what you're going to do is you're going to tuck your you're going to bring your forehead back up, tuck your chin over, and that would be a right tilt. Obviously, the other way of doing that is to keep your head straight, and you would be dropping your your forehead to the right, moving your chin to the left, um, and that's that's important. So, the next point we're looking at are rotations, um, and this is this is a way of showing you right rotation, and so. In the in this position, you would be looking at um, using perhaps your nose as being a point where you can see the elbow move. And so, if you start with it in front of you, and then on the next slide, you'll see that it rotated out to the right. So if you turn your head to the right, that'll show you a right rotation. And then um, a left rotation is going the opposite way. And so. <clears throat> that gives you the description across the bones of, of both translation and rotation.
with the, the bottom line being that once you have these six descriptions in place then you can you can go ahead and describe a bone moving in both direction and rotation and so finally let's show you the video of that and watch all these things happening so we start with anterior rotation of the right femur so you see the arrow moves to then we move on to posterior rotation and again you can see the arrow move to it's important to note that all these movements and rotations are all based on on the bone and and you should base them on, on where the bones moving itself so as if you're in the body so if you're looking at a client face on then um, what when they're doing uh, left tilt you might look at them and think they're tilting to the right but they, they won't be, they will be t tilting to the right from your view but they're actually tilting to their left and that's that's important to sort of know as you watch all this happen we've tried to keep the camera angle camera angle on these um, images in a place that will show you that too So, and there we go. So, that's the first part of starting to observe and predict motion. And that's just looking at, at bone motion. Now, I suggest after this, you go and practice making those movements happen across as many bones as you can, just so that you get used to what a, an anterior and a posterior looks like, perhaps in a humerus or a femur. Um, and then you do the same with a tilt and a rotation. And that'll help you when we get to the HMAC and the dread of filling in of the form. Thanks for listening and uh, I'll see you on the next module.